Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Joey, look at us. Two North Carolina guys. We made it. Yes, we made Greensboro, it. Fayetteville, North Carolina. Guys who love Bowberry biscuits from Bojangles, which we need to get here in North Texas. Uh, sitting here on stage at the Bush Museum. We're a long way away from home. We should open a franchise, a Bojangles franchise down here. You know, Dewey and Cheek. Hey, look, you know, I, I don't know, because I'd be there. I'm already <laughs> fat enough. I'd be there every morning <laughs> killing those biscuits. I own a place. Give me my chicken, egg, and cheese biscuits. So. <laughs> Joey, tell everyone about your mom yeah. calling you because she heard President Bush talking about you. Yeah, and not, not the one today. I've noticed every panelist that comes up here thanks the Bush Institute and President Bush and First Lady, and I was going to until that little quip about no one knowing who I was <laughs> earlier today. Uh, so I thank the staff of the Bush Institute. You've all been fantastic. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I had, I had actually, I had forgotten this until he was up here and he talked about when he was flying to Beijing for the 2008 Olympics. And uh, we, we will get into it, but I had started an organization with a, a, um, a, um, a UCLA athlete uh, called Team Darfur. We were Darfur advocates. We had, we had collected 435 athletes from around the world who were going to advocate for um, women and children, civilians of, of Darfur, the crisis that was going on there in the mid-2000s. And we were pushing the Chinese government to, to stop blocking uh, the UN Security Council from trying to enact uh, some, some civilian protections there. And that was part of our, our mission. And we weren't going to be, um, you know, we were, we were activists, but we weren't going to be disruptive because most of us, were, we were all athletes. And so, of course, the Chinese government is not a fan of that sort of talk by anyone, and certainly not outsiders coming to, to Beijing for the Olympics. And so I had been sort of famous, fam not famously, but banned, um, and my visa revoked the day before I was supposed to leave for the opening ceremonies. And so um, President Bush hopped on the plane, was flying over there, and he lands, and the reporters from the US had started asking him right away, you know, what do you think of, of you know, two years ago, Olympic champion Joey Cheek not being allowed to come to Beijing? And my mom is watching this on TV, and she's like, what did you do? The, the, the president of the United States just got off the plane, and the first thing they're asking is, is about you and the stuff you're up to. So um, I think I'm on the right side of history with that. So I think I'm proud. I mean, I know I'm proud of, of what we accomplished there, but I had totally forgotten that story, which just shows you how much life can change in just a few years. Well, you know, President Bush doesn't forget anything, and he does. If, he is, if he's ribbing you, you're in good company. That's the good thing. He's, yeah. he's, ribbed me. he's never ribbed me. He's never ribbed me. Your, your time will come. <laughs> but I'm, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I'm afraid. So, Joey, you go out in 2006. You're in Italy. You're a speed skater from North Carolina. Yep. Okay, there ain't a lot of speed skating in North Carolina. No. So that in itself was already a major accomplishment. Um, you win the gold medal. You win another medal. And... You get prize money. Yep. If you know any Olympic athletes, especially in winter, and you're living in a place like North Carolina, growing up in a place like North Carolina, it costs money. Yeah. You win, a lot of times you're in debt already, and, and you'd like to pay some of that off, but you decided that you did not want to keep the money. You gave it away. Tell everyone the story from there. Sure. Um, so, yeah, one thing, you're absolutely right about Olympians in general, uh, unless you know their name. So if you, you, you know their name, Michael Phelps, Apollo Ono, yeah, Michelle Kwan, if you know their name, it's a pretty good bet that they have made enough that they can live off of it forever. There are a, the vast majority of U.S. Olympians, at best, will break even by the end of their careers. Most of them finish in the red, and we're able to get there because of the support of family, of, of some sponsors, of... of individuals who want to support U.S. Olympians, but it's very much an amateur, even still, it's very much still an amateur experience. Uh, but that being said, um, in the 2006 Olympics, uh, I was competing, I, going into those games, I was the world champion, and I had sort of set myself on this, this path where I was in a good place to accomplish this thing I dreamt of my entire life. But four years earlier, I'd won a, a bronze medal, my first Olympic medal at the Salt Lake City Games, and I had actually had this epiphany where I realized that it... Um, it's not actually that big a deal. I mean, it's a big deal personally, but what happens is you go, you win this medal, everyone thinks that's awesome for about a week, and then it's done. And that's okay, like I knew what the deal was coming into this, but I thought if I was going into Torino, even if I won, 
I knew the, I knew the gig already. I was going to get a bunch of days of media but the spotlight burns really hot and then it's over. And so I, I had a hunch I wanted to do something more meaningful with those few days when people would listen to what you had to say. And I didn't actually, going in six weeks before the Olympics, I didn't really even know what I was going to be talking about. I sort of had an inclination I'd like to do this. Um, one of my childhood heroes had donated his Olympic bonus money in 1994, a guy named Johan Olaf Koss from Norway. And so I'd seen the impact he had had when he donated his bonus money. And, and so I, I was sort of like, I actually remember the exact moment I was at the World Championships and I was, it was day after, um, the first day I was getting ready to win it. And so I was like, I was in the shower afterwards, I'm washing my hair and I do a lot of my thinking in the shower. And I was just like, oh, you know what? If I donate my bonus money, I bet you I can get all the sponsors to, to match, match what I donated. And as soon as I had that thought, I realized, like, oh, oh damn, now I'm going to have to do it because I've, like, accepted that this is a, an idea that I could do. It's like, oh, man, that's, that's going to hurt. But um, I stepped on the podium. I had the most brilliant sporting day of my life, went to the press conference afterwards, and I said, I know you want to talk about the Olympics, but that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. And so I started talking about what, it, what was going on in Darfur, and, and, and I thought this is an opportunity for me to bridge the gap between what we in America knew and what the world knew was going on. Made the donation, all the Olympic sponsors joined in, um, people watching started donating, so we raised uh, well over a million dollars in just a few days, and then it continued to come in for weeks and months after that. And we were able to have the first, I think, the spear point of a, of a real public relations campaign that was ultimately successful at raising awareness of what was happening in that area. Now, you're doing this at 26 years old, and a lot of it is just your heart. But when you do something like this, because this is, this is courage, you have people who are saying yes, but at the same time you get detractors. Hmm. And take me through, before you, know, you get the call from the Chinese government saying, oh yeah, you're not coming. Um, how you get to that point, and just well, humanitarian work, a lot of times it, it can weigh on you and the stresses of just people that don't always truly understand everything within the mission. Yeah, and I want to point out just how fortunate I was. In many ways, I was insulated from, from the real repercussions. When we talk about sport and activism or mm -hmm. sport and human rights, I was as privileged as you can be, as, I, yeah, as, as protected as you could be. What I found was this, though. When I first started, it was purely humanitarian. I am donating this bonus money to women and children from this area. I want them to have, you know, it was actually, I donated to a sport and play program. So it was, it was, um, it was as inoffensive as one could be. And as I began to advocate more, and as I began to learn the machinations that were happening that enabled these sorts of crimes and, and this attempted genocide to happen, you begin to realize, well, yeah, you know, we need to have these programs in place. These are vital for people in refugee camps. We need these sorts of support, these sorts of um, aid packages. But what they really need is for the helicopter gunships that are flying into villages and lighting everybody up. We need for those to stop. We need for the mercenaries on horseback who would come in and light people's houses on fire. What they really need is to not be gunned down. And as soon as you make that transition, you're not really doing humanitarian work anymore. And that's when you first start hearing some of the pushback. Again, um, the, I would say the hardest things for me were not even personally for me. And so that's why I think of it as not even, not even a sacrifice compared to what sac athletes who, who really make sacrifices face. But Athletes within our organization, that 430 plus athlete coalition we put together, we had athletes who were um, from African countries mm -hmm. and their governments were getting calls from, in this case, you know, we were pushing heavily on the Chinese government. They were getting calls from the Chinese, you know, essentially, uh, the, the, the departments in charge of foreign aid, foreign investment. And they were saying, you know, we're going to start reevaluating how much we're going to be investing or how much aid we're going to be giving to your country because here's a list of these athletes who've signed up to advocate for this or to talk about this at the Olympics. And we don't want anyone talking about this. We don't want anyone saying anything. Athletes are being threatened with not being able to compete in the Olympics. And I started getting these calls, and now I'm 27, so I'm, I'm wizened. I figured at that point, I'll, I'll never be older than this. And <laughs> just one of many idiocies that I had in my head. But um, this, was, this was the first time I was feeling pressure for, for you know, people's livelihoods. And, and athletes were, were in a position where they had been dreaming of this their entire life. They were in this position because I asked them to be in this position. And that pressure weighed on me considerably more than, than I, I don't feel like I made personal sacrifices in the same way that many other athletes did. There may have been some sponsors that wouldn't have, have you know, wouldn't have associated with me, but, but for the most part, 
I, I had the easy job. How do you take that pressure from that athlete mm -hmm. who signed up, is trying to do the humanitarian, the right thing, and you know as, a, as an Olympic champion what all it takes to say, hey, please go live your dream. Yeah. I understand where your heart is, but I want you to compete and live your dream. Yeah, well you have to, I think, and this is the challenge for, for athletes who are interested in, in affecting change. We have this magnificent voice. We are able to talk about things oftentimes that to a group of people that would otherwise never hear them, right? Like these conversations today, although I find them fascinating, these are, these are fairly wonky conversations that are not going to always penetrate into the, the zeitgeist. I, you guys are. I'm, I'm just not you guys. Yeah, yeah, not you guys. Yeah, you, you guys, guys are good. You're good. You're good. Um, You're good. You're good. And we have a chance that we can we can reach people. I think at a different level, being athletes. Now, of course, it's not always. It's not clean. I mean, for for the, all the controversy and even saying his name still probably means con controversy. But you look at you know Colin Kaepernick and the the statements that he made. He sacrificed for what he believed in. Um, when I was talking to these athletes, I firmly believe especially for Olympians who are not gonna make any money at any other point in their lives, I told them, I said, look, you have to, you've spent your life chasing this dream. I will never ask you to, to give that up for this cause, but if you believe in this and this is something you wanna do, I'll, I, will, I will break my arms to try and make it so that you get to compete, that you are protected, that we can get you support where you need it, and, and essentially say, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything that I won't do everything I can to, to be there for you. So it was a time in which I didn't, I don't think I even really knew what I was getting myself into. And then once I did, then you are just trying to make decisions as, they're, as these, these things are coming at you as best you can. And that line of, of believing in sport and believing that athletics and, and global participation is valuable enough that it should be protected and that you know, oftentimes these athletes, especially in, in oppressive regimes, they don't have an option to, 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 to stand against their own government. So, so we have to, those of us who do have that option have to stand up. So as the Olympics start to move towards Paris mm -hmm. and Torino, which you should go back and, you know. 20 year anniversary yeah, party. you should go back. Yeah. Um, what are their opportunities to take their spotlight, their platform and say, look, oh, by the way, this is going on here. We should talk about it. We should pay attention to it. Well, I think that's, that's a really important question. It is easier when you're in liberal countries to, to be able to make statements like that. Nothing about France hosting the Olympics that they ever said athletes were gonna, we are going to prevent you from coming if you've said anything right. against France. So that already makes it a more fertile ground for people who wanna have these sorts of discussions. But it's important to note that the International Olympic Committee, which hosts the Olympics, and part of the reason why I have this worldview as my experience as an Olympian is that when you talk about the Olympics, unlike other sporting events, it's hard to remember, but the Olympics is one of the only things created as a festival of peace, first and foremost. The Olympics aspires to a higher ideal because it set itself out to create this higher ideal, and so it has to live up to it. And that's not always the case. Sporting events oftentimes are created as like professional money-making events. Mm -hmm. And the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, has been pretty clear in their actions that they are not interested in athletes being advocates. They're not interested in athletes making any sort of political statement other than the sort of, you know, we're all better off for having Kumbaya. Olympics. Yeah. Kumbaya. And so, you know, in that case, I have always been very comfortable telling athletes that this is your show. These, this, this two weeks, this is your time when the world pays attention to you. And don't let some bureaucrats in, in, in Switzerland who are just wanting to protect their, their cushy uh, stipends during the Olympics. Don't let them tell you what you can say. Joey Cheek. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. Pleasure. Pleasure.